Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to another conversation with uh, legislators about bills that were worked on and passed during this legislative session. Today, we're focusing on bills relating to the health and well being of Vermonters. We'll be looking at allocations made from the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Bill, also known as the CARES Act out of uh, Washington, D.C., and those funds uh, and how we're going to allocate them and use them in Vermont, as well as the broader topic of healthcare policy. Uh, that obviously many people are discussing when uh, this pandemic struck, how it became a universal health care policy around coronavirus testing and care, uh, and the broader issue of health care policy for the state. It's always a big one. Joining me for this conversation today are Senator Ginny Lyons from Chittenden County. She's the chair of the Senate Committee on Health and Welfare, and Representative Ann Pugh from South Burlington, who's the chair of the House Committee on Human Services. Uh, for those on Facebook, you know, we had intended for Representative Bill Lippert from Charlotte, the chair of the Health Care Committee in the House, to join us. Uh, but he's been unable to join us because he's also now in a Vermont State College's uh, Board of Trustees meeting. And as good as Zooming is, he couldn't be in two places at the same time. I want to thank you both uh, for joining me. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So I want to remind those who are watching, if you have any questions or thoughts, you can post them in the comment section, and we will try to address them during uh, the discussion and, and bring them in. Remember, COVID-19 has impacted every aspect of our lives. Earlier this week, we heard some positive news about the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, there are now three different trials moving to the third and final phase of testing. Uh, those trials are going well, and it's possible a vaccine will be available uh, next year. Um, last week, in a national editorial, uh, Dr. Lee Tso, a primary care physician at Mass General Hospital uh, and an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, wrote that COVID-19 has taught us that every member of our society needs adequate health care. This is not just a progressive talking point. It's the reality of infectious disease. Those without proper care run the risk of acquiring and transmitting the disease to the rest of us. Universal coverage is no longer a charity or a luxury. It's now medically necessary as protection for us all. So let's start with a brief discussion on the ways that you too, as chairs and listener constituents, the ways that you've seen COVID-19 impact Vermonters, their health and our health policy and what lessons we've learned so far. Ginny, why don't you go ahead and start? Uh, terrific. Um, thank you, David, and uh, thank you for having. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you for having us um, in this discussion today. It's been a, a real challenge in the legislature to deal with the pandemic, to reach out to our constituents, and then to hear about all the things that have happened to people during this um, difficult time. It, it's an unbelievable. Um, unbelievable pandemic but the effects have been devastating not you know to people we we've, we've seen people in long lines uh waiting to to get food that's a huge effect people have lost their jobs so they are now don't have the income that they have had previously and then to access testing and health care it continues to be a challenge so just from a very personal level i think people um, are finding it difficult to get food um, and to carry on with their lives with child care um, kids obviously have been out of school on the health care front uh, just going to visit with your physician has become um, a concern People are not wanting to expose themselves to the COVID virus, the coronavirus. So they are uh, seeking their care through telephone or telemedicine. That That is, it's okay. I mean, it's better than not having that, but then that brings up the whole issue of broadband access in our state. So it is a never ending, um, never ending problem. And then compounding that with um, what happens to independent physicians, particularly in the rural parts of our state where um, 
broadband isn't accessible or may not be as, uh, as reliable or cell phone coverage is not as reliable, then we see that these independent docks um, are in jeopardy. So uh, it's, a, it's a big problem. Our hospitals, as you know, our, many of our hospitals have uh, gone into deficit spending and are in the red. Fortunately, um, there has been some independent care money CARES money available from the federal government for healthcare providers. So all of the, those things, I think from, at the patient level, it's access that's been affected significantly. Uh, at the provider level, it is preparing for the worst, preparing for a surge, expanding hospital facilities, trying to find the PPE. Our res care, our long-term care folks have had to shut down visitation, so it makes it really difficult for families. I, I think I'll, I'll stop there for a minute and let Representative Pugh um, join in because uh, I know she's been very much engaged. Um, and we've, uh, and let me say from the outset that one of the things that I think COVID has taught us is the importance of working collaboratively between the House and the Senate. It's been a, a good experience, at least from my side, of working with the uh, House Health Care and House Human Services Committees and the, the folks on those committees. They've been extremely um, forthcoming and uh, we couldn't have accomplished what we did in such a short time without having that uh, cooperative spirit. So I will, I will end there for a minute and um, turn it over to uh, and, Representative, and Pugh. Representative Pugh. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, and thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, to pick up with where you uh, ended, Senator Lyons, um, the cooperation and the collaboration um, are some of the shining lights that uh, Vermont's experience with COVID-19 has shown us. Um, we came together for the most part as a state, um, whether it was across party lines, whether it was House and Senate, whether it was Lieutenant Governor's office and um, the House and Senate, uh, whether it was communities um, or neighbors, we did work together. And I think that has a, um, has a factor in uh, our, at, up to this point, relatively successful um, way of, of dealing with it and having smaller numbers. That said, um, COVID-19 um, pulled the curtain um, away. Remember the Wizard of Oz, who's behind the curtain? Um, and um, it really turned the curtain, pulled the curtain back on the uh, fragile nature of our safety net and on uh, the um, health disparities based on age, based on um, your gender, and based on the color of your skin. Uh, what we have um, found thus far is that uh, even in Vermont, um, while the number of, of black and uh, brown individuals who uh, have contracted COVID-19 are small um, in in comparison to their population, um, the rate is much higher than it is amongst other Vermonters. What we know is um, more women than men um, lost their jobs and were collecting unemployment on the one hand. Um, and on the other hand, uh, many of um, women were disproportionately impacted because they're the people who were doing the essential jobs. They're the nurses. They're the, um, they're more tipped wage workers are women than men. And they provide the personal care um, for people in nursing homes or the childcare centers. Um, so uh, I think what COVID-19 showed us is that we, one, we can come together and we can, um, try to ensure that, um, that we have access to services. Um, but what it did is it showed what we need to do and what happens when we don't, when our safety net, which includes our healthcare system, 
is so fragile. And I will just end with the World Health Association, or the World Health Organization, um, defines sort of health as not just health care, but also um, economic and social well-being. And I think what Senator Lyons was talking about earlier um, in her opening remarks was that connection with all of that in terms of um, access um, to a healthy lifestyle. Absolutely, thank you. And um, I've been going back and forth with a constituent from Bristol who works in education, I don't believe is a full teacher and has been unable to access unemployment because they do have a contract to come back in the fall, can't get PUA for some reason and um, is ineligible and is really struggling on a lot of fronts financially and, and that just puts them in a more precarious position in yep. a health perspective as well. Um, and these are, I'm sure each of you probably have 30 stories you can tell of, of if not 100 or 200 of people reaching out with these kinds of struggles. Mm -hmm. um, one of the uh, things we're going to pivot to the work that you all accomplished as legislator. Uh, last month, uh, you passed H 965. It's an act relating to healthcare and human services uh, related appropriations from the coronavirus relief fund, often called CRF, if you hear that acronym out there. Uh, can each of you share some highlights from the bill, uh, important policies that were included, and, and how Vermonters can access some of those programs that are supported and are put in place to help make sure at least we can't maybe say all, but fewer people uh, fall through the cracks. Representative Pugh, why don't you start since last time we gave the <laughs> Senator the first, the first whack. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, what I will do is I will leave um, a major part of the bill was a healthcare stabilization fund and I will leave that um, to uh, Senator Lyons and perhaps I will focus on um, those aspects of the Health and Human Services Relief Fund, COVID Relief Fund bill that relate to um, population-based um, public health um, on basic needs and the social and economic determinants of um, health and recovery. Um, and so what we can start out with, um, on some level, we can start, you know, start out with um, mental health. Um, and mental health is health care. And Senator Lyons will talk a bit about that um, later. Um, but in order, um, during this time of stress and uncertainty, um, having, being, being, um, being upset, being worried um, is a normal reaction. Um, that said, it can also exacerbate um, the issues for individuals um, who, are, who have been living with mental illness. And it can also exacerbate individuals who are in recovery from substance use disorder, disorders because they're home and their resources that they would go to for um, support um, were closed. And so one of the things um, that we, one of the things that is in the bill that we passed, which you might go, what does this have to do with um, health and human services? Is there's money actually um, directed to the Agency of um, Natural Resources for our parks and things like that so that there's signage so that people are able to go outdoors and to um, actually recreate in distances, um, appropriately um, distance. Um, and, and there is uh, support for some, some um, a lot of money went into increasing um, telephone support lines and for um, providing the um, technology necessary for people to um, be able to pick up a phone or pick up a tech or make a text when they were in crisis in either a mental health or they were in a, in a perhaps going to um, reach for the next drink or reach for um, the next substance. Um, as 
as businesses reopened and as parents went back to work, access to um, childcare and summer programs um, and after school programs for um, was critical for both the health and economic recovery. And this bill has um, that we passed has $12 million in it um, to provide to those entities, um, one, so that they can be, they can remain open, that they can make the changes that they need to so that everyone is, um, everyone is safe uh, in terms of that. Um, I talked, mentioned earlier about health disparities um, and how in particular uh, our um, uh, people of um, Vermonters of color and um, were, were negatively impacted by COVID-19. Well, when we turn to um, our new Americans, um, uh, they're, exp they're, ex they're also exp experiencing symptoms and illnesses at a higher rate. And um, they too have jobs that commun um, where um, the importance of communicating important health information in a language that they understand um, is essential. And there's um, $700,000 directed towards um, two organizations. While um, their headquarters may be in Chittenden County, they serve um, new Americans and people with color across the state. Um, that's the Association of Africans Living in Vermont and the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program. And um, this money will be um, allocated to these um, two organizations to both um, promote, whether it is um, uh, communicating the important information in a language that, um, or a format that people um, understand, or, and also to connect them with food, shelter, some of those basic things. Um, or finally, how do you access um, childcare? or are there other ways of caring for their children that are in there? So that piece is in there. Um, if you don't have food, if, you're, um, if there's a pit in your stomach because you're hungry, um, you're going to be more at risk um, of uh, COVID, um, of negative impacts from COVID-19. And so um, I'm very, I'm very um, pleased with the support that the House and the Senate and the governor had in um, really putting significant resources to ensure that um, Vermonters do not go hungry. Um, close to $5 million was um, um, allocated to the Vermont Food Bank, and they will, out, they will distribute that to the food shelves um, around the state. Um, as well as uh, $12 million to make available um, for summer meals. Because as we know, um, many young people uh, get the majority of their meals through schools and through the summer programs. And with COVID-19, many of the summer programs um, were not able to be at full, um, have the same number of, of, of children involved. And so this way, uh, there was creative ways of either delivering food and ensuring that um, those um, individuals, um, our children are not hungry. And we're also keeping an eye out on older Vermonters. Um, older Vermonters are, um, if, they, if they contract uh, COVID-19, they are more likely to have ser serious repercussions um, and serious illness because of their age and some of the um, their health conditions, um, and so they're staying in, and so they're not they're not going to their um, they're, they're not going out. Maybe they're not going to go grocery shopping, or they're not going to go to Meals on Wheels. And so there are initiatives to um, support um, older Vermonters through um, uh, perhaps more delivery um, of Meals on Wheels, of connecting. Um, seniors with restaurants and having restaurants um, deliver. And so that was another um, piece of the bill. Uh, let me stop there. I could talk way too long. And 
Um, if there's time, we'll go back to some other things um, and, and let uh, Senator Lyons talk about um, how we are trying to stabilize the healthcare workforce and healthcare system. Thank you. Go ahead, Senator. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Representative Pugh has uh, given a has given a lot of information. Um, I want to step back just a bit uh, because as we look at the the healthcare stabilization bill, uh, H965, it also included uh, some funds that came from a, a um, hazard pay uh, bill that the House and Senate worked on. So there's $28 million that will go to some frontline workers that may not uh, see uh, the benefit of, uh, as you were saying, whether it's UI or, or um, increased pay when they're working in this really difficult environment. So there was 20, there is $28 million that is available and will be distributed to folks who are working in nursing homes, residential care facilities, um, uh, and others who are on the front lines. Uh, let me just, I, I'll just read some off for you. Assisted living uh, folks. Um, and then some, some folks who are working with uh, those individuals with disabilities and who may be providing care and services, but they're not healthcare workers, but they are certainly frontline workers and need some uh, support and protection. So that hazard pay uh, went went to them as well. People working in homeless shelters um, and taking care of folks who are who are homeless uh, that they're also eligible for that hazard pay. One of the difficulties, of course, in distributing such a great uh, amount of money is understanding what. Uh, <laughs> how the grants will be distributed uh, overall and then how they'll be accounted for. And as we were looking at this uh, money, uh, for example, uh, Representative Pugh mentioned the stabilization, healthcare stabilization fund, which is by far the biggest part of H965, the $275 uh, million. Um, that, that money needs to go out in a way that we can assure ourselves that it's being used the way uh, we would like it to be used. So it's getting to the, the nurses or the, or the uh, rural docs and, or the uh, dental assistants and so on. We wanna make sure that it's getting where it, where it needs to go so that the healthcare environment is stabilized. And that is a serious problem. I think I've talked a little bit earlier about how disruptive COVID has been. And it has shined a light, I think as uh, Representative Pugh was talking about, it has shined a light on the gaps in our system. And so the connections between um, healthcare providers and uh, mental health counseling, and the need to ensure that our designated agencies are, are covered with, um, with CARES funds. So that's included in the stabilization grant. When we developed the bill, we also felt it be important that this be these be need-based grants. So when people apply, and they and you can apply um, to the Department of Vermont Health Access within the Agency of Human Services, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. But the um, it, it, it's really uh, the, the applications will all go in and then decisions will be made about how to allocate this first round of funding, the $275 million on a needs-based uh, determination. I think that's important. I think, uh, Lieutenant Governor, you were talking earlier about how some people can't access PUA or UI. And I've heard the same thing. And one of the concerns that I've had about uh, the distribution of funds um, for, for, uh, econ from the economic development folks is that it's first come, first serve. That, uh, that's unfortunate because some of the 
um, smaller organizations may be left out. And we did not want to have that happen within the healthcare environment. So the Healthcare Stabilization Fund of $275 million covers a broad range of uh, services. It covers our designated agencies who, uh, such as the Howard Center or the Washington County Mental Health <coughs> folks uh, who provide uh, health care, um, mental health counseling, substance use disorder counseling, and, it, and that is li are linked with our hospitals or our providers uh, in, a, in a very important way uh, in our communities. So uh, they're also included in that group are independent docs, uh, physician assistants, uh, naturopathics, and others. So all of the providers who we go to for our primary care um, or for our, um, or the services that we need when we're not feeling well. So um, because a lot of those businesses were categorically shut down from March to June. So the, the March to June period from March 1st to June 30th is the period that's covered. Um, and I think those dates are pretty accurate. I, I'm the, I might have the, uh, the March 1st or the June 30th, slightly wrong, but I think that's it. Those are the months that are being covered by this $275 million on, on need-based applications. And um, as I said before, you can go to the, the Department of Vermont Health Access uh, web, web page and uh, identify the application process. I th this is very important and the applications need to be in uh, by the middle of August so that the needs determination can be made. And I hope that covers a little bit of the, sure. of the process for getting the funds. But beyond that, I will say, um, I know we're going to talk about mental health a little bit later, um, but we did have, we do have a, a, a huge problem going on right now because kids are home from school. And we've seen an increase in uh, abusive relationships uh, developed and also expanded. So child abuse is something that concerns us all. And uh, the, we've, we've put um, uh, $200,000 in for the, the Pathways Warm Line. That's a suicide prevention. But we've also put money in for, um, for as, as Representative Pugh has said, $12 million in for child care providers, for summer camps, for after school programs. And, and some of the linkages that can be made there uh, and through parent child centers are through audio visual when people don't wish to go and um, go out of their homes or can't go out of their homes. There may be an opportunity here for us to think about um, then how to expand this in the future so that kids have access to counseling. I know that the, the disconnect for, with schools has been a challenge. So the disconnect between the school counselor and the child, um, I, I think it's important for us to reflect on how to improve that. I think the parent and child center programs are so exceptional uh, that they can help um, maybe build that. Uh, also in a dialogue with um, Dr. First at the Children's Hospital, he is extremely concerned about um, kids' mental health. So there, there is an interest there of expanding um, some uh, audiovisual, some telephonic, some internet connection after schools begin again to keep kids connected with the support services that they need. So there's a crossover between our educational system and our healthcare system that I think is fully integrated into the bill that we have in front of us with the, with the $12 million for the after school and other programs. Um, right. Children's, right. I, I wanna stop there, but I don't wanna ig ignore children's integrated services, which are so critical, and maybe we can come back to those a little bit later, but yeah, there's a lot in the bill going on. <laughs> Yeah, there is. And sorry. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> there, you, you did, but... there is a lot to fit in, and we have a couple other topics we want to address, and maybe you can fit some of it into those. And I think one of the things you're pointing out is how uh, interrelated so many of these issues are, you know, whether it's education and health, food and health. Uh, and then now we've also talked about language issues, uh, as Representative Pugh talked about, and the ability to translate 
some of the uh, needs around uh, COVID care and COVID prevention into multiple languages. So we are, um, I think one of the um, sort of amazing things, if I can use those words around this uh, challenge is that we are all seeing how incredibly interrelated different sectors of governance, different sectors of our society, and different factors of people's lives are with respect to our health and our and our potential prosperity. So um, one of the groups uh, that we are thinking about is, uh, you know, and how we're experiencing this all in different ways is how hard it is to keep the required physical distance. Um, we're all going through the, phys the challenge of not seeing our friends, even some of our family members. Uh, and it's particularly hard, I think, for those living uh, in homes with violence or abuse. I think one of you started to allude to that earlier. And mental health is a big piece of what's going on. And it's, it's equally important as physical health. And the strains that people are under right now are sometimes pushing uh, more folks into some mental health challenges. So maybe you could talk about some of the challenges that you're hearing about, some of the challenges our, our agencies are facing, um, and some of the programs that are available to the mental well-being of Vermonters. And I think someone else touched on this in terms of um, substance abuse as well. So as that gets pushed more to the forefront. So maybe a couple of examples, um, and you know, you could go in any direction you want in that area. We're gonna try to keep it to maybe six or seven minutes because we've got a little long on the first ones. But uh, Senator Lyons, why don't we start with you? We'll keep alternating who starts. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll try not to go on too long. I, I will think of an example that came to us during our testimony, and that is that uh, how do you serve someone with a substance use disorder uh, or who requires a uh, medically assisted treatment, and how do you make sure that they get the uh, support, A, the support services they need, or B, perhaps the pharmaceutical support, the, uh, the MAT that they need. And uh, so the Howard Center was pretty creative and they uh, develop, have developed a drive-through program where um, Patients can come in, they can drive through, they can speak with a counselor with masks on, uh, they can access their, uh, their uh, prescription, or they can, and they can ask questions and, and get the support services that they've been used to. That's just, that's one example of some creativity that's going on. Of course, the need there would be for having uh, protective equipment PPE and uh, for both the patient and the and the counselor, so that that's being made available. Just to extend the the comment a little bit, uh, mental health counseling is difficult over audiovisual. People really need to have access, and uh, so we in one of our bills that was COVID a COVID related bill. We did add in the 10 year planning process for our mental health, um, the t mental health plan for the state of Vermont. I think that is going to be a significant step. Uh, it's a, a nascent, it's the beginning. Uh, and I, I think that we need to be looking at that. The other thing that we're doing is looking at how to improve uh, the services that are offered and to stabilize uh, Brattleboro Retreat, which is so critically important both for adults but also for adolescents who need uh, mental health uh, support services. So those are some of the things that we've done. I, I will say that the work for the um, um, New Americans that Representative Pugh is talking about cannot be underestimated in terms of supporting the mental health of those populations and how critical it will be as we go forward to, to keep track of the populations that are most affected by COVID. And that would include women, LGBTQ, um, Af African Americans, and, and other um, groups that are more susceptible to the, uh, to the disease. And we did add that in to our, um, into the public health uh, discussion. So our public health folks are keeping track of that information. I'll turn it over to Representative Pugh um, and uh, let her say a few words. Thanks, Senator Lyons. Um, 
in the interests of being brief, I'll just perhaps identify a couple of <clears throat> resources. Um, uh, there is the tried and true 211. When someone is in, whether it's a mental health crisis or another crisis, this is Vermont's, um, I want to say, directory to finding help. Um, and that's um, a good place to start. And as Senator Lyons mentioned, um, all of our designated agencies or our community mental health centers, they have crisis services and those continued. Those continued during um, the, more, the more shutdown period and they're continuing now. <clears throat> as mentioned before, um, we, we, we were told and we've experienced how helpful it is to have someone on the other end of the phone who is a peer. Maybe you're not in a crisis, but you need to talk with someone. And so there's money um, to support the um, peer hotlines um, and the peer, war but the peer run, excuse me, warm lines to have that be 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, in speaking with um, people, the um, domestic violence and sexual um, violence hot hotlines continued, continued during um, COVID and um, are continuing now. What they saw in the beginning, um, those two lines was a, um, a drop in calls um, initially. Um, but after the first couple of weeks or a month, um, there's been, um, sort of an uptick in calls to the hotline um, and uh, services are continuing. Um, those, that is an area where with the <clears throat> help of their volunteers, with the help of their professional staff and with the um, resources from the state, um, the uh, 15 um, agencies, um, domestic violence and um, sexual um, violence prevention um, um, and help organizations were able to continue having um, both their hotlines and to provide um, support services and uh, if not a shelter, um, a hotel room. Um, if someone um, more concerning um, and Senator Lyons mentioned that sort of is that uh, reports of child abuse actually have been way down and that's frightening. Um, and there's concern as to um, why that is. And that's something we need to be paying attention to um, as people uh, remain more isolated. Uh, now that we've moved into the 21st century, a long time, we're almost out of it. No, I know we're just beginning it. There's, um, you can text. If you are in crisis, you can actually text. And if you, the number, um, 741, 70, 741. If you just text VT for Vermont um, to that number, you will get a call back from a um, trained crisis uh, counselor in any of those situations. So not, um, maybe not ideal, but um, there, are, um, there are places to turn and we're seeing what works. All right. Any last thoughts on that? Um, it's okay. I think, just... Yeah, no, I think actually, and this is more, I mean, for me, it's more a question of the things that have been working, whether it's in mental health um, and substance use. And <clears throat> just in terms of um, substance use treatment, um, Senator Lyons talked about the creative um, response that the Howard Center was doing. At the same time, um, while that is happening, um, because of other issues, um, the hospital up in St. Albans stopped offering um, medication-assisted treatment. They closed their um, hub, and um, actually Howard is going to step up to do that. But because of some of the financial um, challenges that, as a result of COVID-19 that has impacted all of our hospitals, and this was a part of the hospital that um, maybe was not their core function. They needed to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. So we have to we have to really look at what um, has how the fabric of our 
more traditional healthcare system has changed and what's been working and what's not. And whilst I agree with Senator Lyons that um, perhaps telemental mental health is not um, the best, some individuals have been able to find that as um, a lifesaver right now. Yeah, yeah, that's important stuff, thank you. So um, our last sort of full question is, uh, is, is that in addition to mental health, uh, we know that healthy lifestyles make Vermonters more resilient uh, to a wide variety of illnesses, including stress, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, obesity, and COVID-19. I've seen recently great statistics about Vermont. I think we all recognize that Vermont is doing relatively very well, if not the best in the country, at keeping the cases down. Uh, we have some good fortunate circumstance around that. We've got generally a healthier population. People pay attention to what they're eating and their general health. We're a very rural state, which keeps people farther apart. Uh, we don't have a major city. So, uh, and we have a very compliant and uh, supportive general public that's mostly stepping up and doing the right thing to try to reduce the spread. Um, but there are state programs that have helped make some of those things reality in Vermont, both from the past and some that you've uh, put into some of these bills for the present. Uh, one that I highlighted last week was the Everyone Eats program. It's about a $5 million investment that pays restaurants to produce 18,500 meals a week through the end of December. And those meals are distributed to food insecure Vermonters. And I'm extremely supportive of this program because it, it creates a flow of money that really multiplies its impact because you, we as a state will be giving money to the restaurants. They will be paying employees. They will be buying some of that food from local farms that they used to buy for their regular flow of commerce when they were more fully functioning restaurants, when our society was normal. And hungry people are gonna be getting healthy meals. And we know that quality food uh, is just one important tool that keeps struggling Vermonters healthier. So maybe you all could share some programs that um, other programs or allocations that are available either through the CARES Act or you know, you've both been very active in health care in general and uh, our well-being of our Vermonters for a long time in your respective roles. What are some of those foundational things we've done and or what are some things in the CARES Act that are working towards broader health to uh, make sure we're more resilient? And Anne, I think you get to go first this time. Oh, gosh. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually think that, um, <clears throat> David, your example is um, just a wonderful example. Um, I believe, actually, one of the impetuses of that, one, California has been doing that. Um, and at the same time, this is similar to what, um, but they were doing it on their own, what Skinny Pancake was doing. That's exactly right, yep. Um, and there was a, um, a, a, a program spearheaded <clears throat> by uh, some individuals in South Burlington that was totally volunteer run and by donation. And they brought, um, restaurant meals to providers. Um, it was called Frontline Foods um, Vermont, and they raised over $300,000 and would bring it, they brought it to hospitals, they brought it to um, nursing homes, they brought it to fire departments, but so that those uh, central workers, um, one, got to know that they were supported. And that was, I think, a really wonderful way of the community coming together. Um, some of the, you're gonna perhaps laugh, some of the programs that we have been doing over the years around tobacco cessation um, have been really important um, because one of the uh, greater risk factors in COVID-19 is um, is lung disease. And um, so the work that we have been doing in terms of um, tobacco cessation and clean indoor air and things like that has been, I believe, um, effective. Uh, and um, as well, um, I mentioned in passing, we uh, 
in the Health and Human Services COVID bill. There's actually money to um, the Agency of Natural Resources um, to make it possible um, and more feasible for people to enjoy the outdoors in Vermont in terms of state lands and state parks. So I will, I will um, leave it there as things that um, we have done and we should be proud of. We should be proud of the fact that um, for the most part, um, Vermonters, when we needed to stay in, stayed in. And so that, that was very important and we all worked together. Oh, that's right. Uh, Jenny, center lines. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, obviously, Anne, Representative Pugh has brought up a significant number of things. Uh, as long as I've been in the legislature, we have always worked to improve our farm to school program. And I think that the, um, the Food Security Alliance, I guess they call themselves the Insecurity Alliance, but I, <laughs> I like to think of them as the Food Security Alliance uh, the, the good guys, and they have worked so hard to bring local foods uh, to, to schools and to the summer program and the money that we put obviously into the CARES uh, funding program is supporting that. So all of those programs have uh, become critically important and robust and people begin to see why they are so important to us. The, uh, the work that our food shelf has done to bring uh, restaurant foods or foods that are, might be discarded but are still available uh, to people and have taken the, those monies and put the, the food into the food shelf and use those to take care of people who are desperately in need. Uh, we, do have, um, the, uh, we do have in our state the SNAP program, which is a federally funded program. And, you know, the more people who sign up for the SNAP program, as people lose their jobs, they lose income, the income goes down to a level that may make them eligible for uh, the uh, food program, the federal food program. And so the uh, Food Alliance uh, and the, when the National Guard was distributing boxes, did put uh, a little application form and information in uh, with that, um, with the food that people were receiving when they were in their long lines. And um, so people can apply for SNAP. It's not something to be concerned about. I mean, it, I think a lot of people become embarrassed about applying for a federal or a state program. They see it as a handout. Uh, but this is a time when food security is important and people should feel comfortable in asking for that hand. Uh, it's a warm hand, it's a comfort. And uh, so if you are, if you do need food, please do apply for the SNAP program. The other things I think about, um, as uh, Representative Pugh was talking about the Agency of Natural Resources, we did put $200,000 into the Youth uh, Conservation Corps. They do an exceptional amount of work on uh, local food uh, farming development and working with youth uh, to engage them in uh, agriculture, wood products and other areas, just being outside. So I think that was a good investment that I see as a wellness investment for our state. The other programs that we've had in place and Ann mentioned, uh, Representative Pugh mentioned our um, uh, tobacco sensation work and that continues to be important and the, the the fewer young people and older people who are smoking or vaping, I think the more um, people are, are healthy. The, then we've also had um, important work in the area of healthcare in our blueprint program that stabilizes people with chronic illnesses and a team approach. So a team approach with a nutritionist or a physical therapist or others who can help uh, patients who either are susceptible to diabetes or other illnesses, uh, long-term illnesses, uh, can receive the attention that they need, not just the, the MD or the, or the naturopath. And then finally, I would like to bring up the wonderful prevention work that we worked on collaboratively between the House and Senate, uh, House Human Services and uh, Senate Health and Welfare 
uh, a prevention counsel, also a chief prevention officer in uh, the agency administration in the governor's office. Um, that's been put on, I think, on hiatus a little bit because of COVID, but it's something that we can really feel very proud about and uh, of, and I think it's time for us to begin thinking uh, in the future how we can uh, use that prevention office and the prevention council in the Department of Health to our best advantage. So uh, that's just a, a high, high level, but um, didn't want to spend any more time. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. We are, are going to wrap up here shortly. I do want to mention uh, I've heard about some food programs, not only through the, you know, the food shelves and some of these pop-up organizations like Representative Pugh spoke about in South Burlington, um, but also there's mutual aid groups all over the state. And I know the Vermont Council on Rural Development uh, has had a, a, a listing of some of those organizations. Just yesterday, I was in Burlington uh, doing some deliveries, maybe it was two days ago from my farm, and I met a guy who was part of a, a free food program where they were collecting food and uh, there were two restaurants cooking that up and they were giving out food and water and, and beverages to some of the homeless population in Burlington. Um, and our farm has donated to various food shelves and, and now we'll be bringing them some of the overflow food from some of the sales we're not having uh, due to the ships and markets because of uh, COVID-19. I know a lot of farms across the state are doing that kind of work. Someone's coming out tomorrow to glean. Um, so I wanna uh, see if either one of you wanna just offer a quick one minute wrap up, uh, kind of a last thought, um, maybe a detail about a program that's been enacted or policy that you wanna know folks know about. Sounds like you've mostly put a lot of it out there, but Senator, if you have just a, a minute left of, of anything else you wanna throw in here and then we'll, we'll go to the representative. Um. David, thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure to talk about these issues. Uh, I did mention children's integrated services earlier. This, these are services offered to kids with autism or other disabilities. I think we have tried to pay attention uh, to how those services are delivered and paid for, and I, it's incumbent upon all of us to continue that work. I, I would just like to thank everyone uh, in our state for the really thoughtful way they have approached COVID, have used public health information, and, um, and has kept Vermont as safe as it, as it is right now. And also want to thank my colleagues in the House for their good work and, of course, my Senate colleagues. Um, I think we've, uh, we've risen to the challenge uh, this time, and I, and I know that we can do it again. And, as we look to the future, I will be working to um, develop a plan for the future so that healthcare is at the top and not the bottom for any of our hazard mitigation or, uh, or planning in the future, state planning in the future. But thanks again, uh, very much appreciate it. Great, and uh, Representative Pugh. Um Thank you. Um, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Senators um, Lyons. Um, I think I just want to end with, um, while it's no secret that uh, Vermonters are struggling right now, um, what uh, the legislature, along with the governor, um, attempted to do in um, the Health and Human Services um, COVID um, mitigation bill we passed was to make strategic um, um, decisions around where to put the money that are um, to th that are um, both strategic and that are equitably um, allocated, um, and we're asking for reports, and so we will see um, if in fact that happened, and we will I think be able to learn what we did well, and how we can prepare better, um, and what we need to continue to do, and what we learned that huh. We should continue to do this. We don't need a pandemic to say um, people need more money in their pockets or people who are receiving um, food assistance um, should be able to um, buy hot food and not just cold food. Um, so um, I do think that on some level, um, the majority of Vermonters um, support science 
um, have been following the directives of the Commissioner of Health and have appreciated the, um, the guidance of the legislature and everyone. And um, uh, Lieutenant Governor, I want to thank you for your um, leadership and for um, ensuring that um, what we have passed got out there. So thank you. Sure. Yeah, it's one of the one of the opportunities in this job is to uh, keep disseminating the information. And I think so many Vermonters are struggling and, and looking for the information on how to access uh, both what's available and how to help push forward as a community to uh, help our neighbors. Uh, I want to thank you both uh, and uh, for joining us, all of the folks that are watching. Um, if you have additional questions, please feel free to email me at uh, info at zuckermanforvt.com. I want to mention that uh, some couple of bills that uh, passed the legislature didn't get enacted, uh, unfortunately, but I think would have helped uh, with some of the um, situation people are in was uh, raising the minimum wage and paid family leave. Uh, those are both vetoed. And uh, again, if people had if they had had raises this year from uh, raising the minimum wage, a lot of our essential workers would be just that little bit better off, especially those essential workers that weren't eligible for the CARES funding that uh, Center Lions, I think, described earlier for health workers and, and folks in medical fields that might have been exposed. Tomorrow uh, at noon, we're going to have another one of these uh, right here on Facebook. Uh, it'll, I'll be hosting a roundtable conversation about schools reopening. Uh, I will be joined by a school principal, educators representing um, the primary, middle, and high school levels of education, and the chair of the Senate Committee on Education, uh, Senator Philip Baruth. I hope you'll be able to join me at noon tomorrow for that conversation. Uh, for more details on that event and for information on all my upcoming virtual roundtable conversations and events, you can visit the website zuckermanforvt.com. And in, on the events page, you'll also find a link to recordings and videos of past virtual events. Past topics have included an update on the Global Warming Solutions Act and climate issues, an update on the CARES allocations around housing and broadband and, and uh, workplace UI. And of course, you can also find those videos on my Facebook and YouTube pages at ZuckermanforVT.com. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in and uh, please stay connected and again, Thank you, Senator Lyons, Representative Pugh, for taking time today. And I know Representative Bill Lippert had intended to be here. And for those that are watching, uh, you probably had expected him. Unfortunately, he also had a state colleges meeting that he then had to attend to instead. Uh, but welcome and thank you both for being here. 